welcome to lecture three of ops. This will most likely be our last lecture for the quarter. We might have another soldering workshop uh, later down the road. Uh, but in terms of lectures and, and new material that we'll be learning, this will be the last one for this quarter. And it'll culminate with you guys basically putting together everything you've learned, LEDs, push buttons, speakers, things like that, and getting you guys ready for microcontrollers for next quarter. So, All right, so a general recap. So project two, even if you didn't know, it was due today. So who finished project two? All three parts? Nice, nice. Yeah. OK, <laughs> well, some of you guys might think that you're done, but some of you guys have not responded to the feedback that we gave you on Slack. So if you haven't checked your Slack lately, and we haven't responded to you guys with like, oh, good job, or you got checked off, then go back to it, because you, you might, um, your breadboarding or the online portion might have had some errors in it. Yeah. yeah. And, <clears throat> yes. Also, one more thing. Uh, last time, some people were saying that it was hard to see the PowerPoint. So I just posted the PowerPoint right, right now on the Facebook group. If for any reason you can't see the, what's on the PowerPoint, you can just check it out on your phone. Yeah. Yeah. And then soldering. So give me a thumbs up if soldering was like easy money, and thumbs down if it was like your worst nightmare. Oh. Good, good, nice, nice, nice. I, I'm, I'm seeing these, good, good. Hopefully by the end of the year, there will be like two thumbs up instead of both thumbs down. But anyway, so if um, a lot of you guys probably had to desolder a lot of things, which is a learning process. We learn from mistakes, right? And then so you guys probably use pumps. But there's, um, if pumps didn't work out for you guys, um, for next time, there are soldering wicks um, because a lot of the pumps get um, Jammed. Um, like jammed, yeah, they get and then jammed. it's like kind of hard to fix at the moment. So just remember that there is an alternative method to desolder your things. And then lastly, remember to clean up after yourselves. Um, we stress this a lot. We're gonna keep pounding at this, pounding, pounding this at you guys until the lab is perfectly clean when you guys leave. So relatively, you guys have been doing a good job. Some of you guys, not so much, but just keep that in mind. All right. Oh, uh, the ops lecture that we put up, we, we made it private. Oh, we'll, sure. We'll fix that. Okay. okay. So I apologize for that. The lecture that we put up on Facebook is accidentally uh, private, so we'll fix that right after this. Um, but yeah. Should I do it so, right okay. now? Uh, sure, you can okay, I'll fix it. it. All right, so just some common <laughs> things that you guys should remember. Just remember that picture. Yeah, so VCC stands for uh, the power source, right? And then the three lines stand for ground. So some people ask me this on the schematic for project two, like, oh, where's the power? Where's the ground? In our first lecture for ops, way back in week two or week three, we explained to you like several different uh, general schematic symbols that you'll see, of which VCC was one of them, and that stands for the power supply. So the positive end of your battery, or the positive terminal of your battery, all right? And let's say you have a battery on the left-hand side, or on your right-hand side, right? That's a schematic <laughs> symbol for a battery. And the part that says plus is a positive side, and that would refer to VCC. And the part that says minus is a negative side, and that refers to ground. So you know, if for any reason that you get confused, just remember the slide, uh, which side is positive, which side is negative. Uh, it shouldn't be too big of a, a deal now, but just in case. And so. The higher voltage is on the positive end, the lower voltage is on ground. Like it's pretty uh, self-explanatory on why, why that's true. VCC stands for voltage, voltage collector, voltage common collector. Yeah, or common, yeah, voltage common collector, yeah. So it's just a common place where all the voltages meet, so your power supply. All right. Any more questions? All right. Next slide. All right. So push buttons. So you guys um, sort of worked with this push button earlier. But just to recap, so the um, way a push button works is there's four pins, right? And then they're either connected horizontally or, horizontally or vertically. Um, it's hard to tell f um, for sure with the plain eye. But you know for sure that. Um, they will, the diagonals will not be connected unless the button is pressed. 
So this next project, which will involve more than one button, three actually, um, just be really careful to um, keep that in mind because you guys will be soldering, which means that if you guys solder the buttons like in the wrong orientation, then you guys will have to desolder and do all that stuff again. Yeah, and then but if you guys are really curious, there is a way to check how the push buttons are connected, and that is through the next slide. All right, so many of you guys, when you guys were soldering and you guys came up to us, asked, like, oh, what's wrong with this? We would take out a little yellow instrument and go through, try to debug your circuit, right? And that yellow instrument that we use is actually called a digital multimeter or digital multimeter, right? This one over here is black. The ones in the lab are yellowish. And the two most important uh, things that you guys should remember when you guys are using it are which ports to turn the dial to and what they represent. Right? So the first point, you might be looking for connectivity. Right? Are two points that you want to be connected? Do the, does the solder trail actually make them connected? Right? Uh, for example, you want um, pin 8 on your, or pin 1 on your 555 timer that has to go to ground no matter what, because right? that's the ground pin of your 555 timer. So you want to put, you want to see if that pin 1 is actually connected to ground. So what you would do is you would take a digital multimeter, right? turn the dial over to uh, the symbol over there. It's, it looks almost like a noise or some kind of signal pop coming out, right? And you, you just check with the red and black lead whether there's a connection in between those two points by putting the red and black lead between the two points that you want uh, to check through. And if it beeps, that means that there's a connection there. If it doesn't beep, that means there's no connection there, right? And so essentially what you're going to be doing with this is checking uh, if there's a connection where there should be a connection or there's a connection where there shouldn't be a connection. Like for example, if you had pin one, which goes to ground, also somehow connect to power and ground, then you know that you have uh, uh, an extra solder trace somewhere that's connecting it to, uh, to power. And then you have to figure out where that is by looking at what other common places are connected to power and ground that shouldn't be connected like that, and then desolder that using the pump or using the wick, right? So in the case of the push button, right, if you wanted to see which ones are connected, you could just put the, the red and the black terminals at two different points in the push button. And it w if you, without pressing it, if, if it starts beeping, then you know that those sides are connected. All right. The next thing you want to uh, do, uh, or the other, other thing that you might want to do is to check the voltage. So is there a voltage change? Is like pin three of your five five timer, is that actually outputting a voltage uh, after the rest of your circuit seems to be done. Like that's how many people or several people had to replace their 555 timers because they were broken, right? So an easy way to tell that is if there's no output voltage coming out of pin three. And essentially, instead of turning the dial over to the signal, you turn it over to uh, V, right? There's several different V ones. Um, choose whichever one seems appropriate, right? Like, so we're using a 3.7 volt battery. So two, if you turn it over to the two volt one, you won't, you're not gonna get an accurate reading. But if you turn it over to the 2000 volt one or 200 volt one, that'll also give you an accurate reading. So turn it, in, turn it to the 20 volt one so that you can see uh, a value between two and, or zero and 20 volts, when in this case 3.7 volts is actually being outputted out of uh, the 555 timer. And you do a similar thing where you put the two leads at two points on your solder or on your breadboard and check how much voltage uh, is between those two points, right? And then a third thing, actually, that we noticed today uh, are that some of our LEDs seem to be backwards, right? You know how we said that longer lead is positive, shorter lead is negative? And while that's generally the case for like 90 to 99% of LEDs out there, some of the LEDs in our batch have had the opposite, where shorter lead is positive and longer lead is ground. And the way that you can check for that is on the digital multimeter, there's actually a symbol for LED, right? You turn it over to that, and you put the positive end of the, so the red uh, terminal from the DMM to where you believe is the positive end of the LED, and the ground terminal to the ground end of the LED. If it lights up, and if there's a, a voltage shown on the DMM, then you know you have the right uh, polarity. And if that's not the right polarity, then you just switch it, and then keep in mind for next time that that, that particular LED is backwards or forwards or however uh, it is. And that way, you don't have to keep resoldering and desoldering and plugging it back in in different ways when you're checking if your circuit's uh, working or not. So those are the three most important uh, things that you want to do. So while, we'll, while any officer will be in the lab, right, you don't necessarily need to come to us to debug now, right? Um, 
you can just pick up a DMM. There's DMMs on, on the shelf. And you can just uh, debug your, your circuit yourself. And keep in mind that you want to look for connectivity. So that's the, the sound signal. Uh, you want to look for voltage changes or voltage drop between two points. And then if you think you have a weird LED problem, then the LED symbol as well. So those are the three symbols you, that you want to keep in mind. All right, so our next project is piano. Hey. hey. Well, so basically, um, it will be s sort of similar to that of, the, that of project one, the digital synthesizer. So can you go to the next one? Yeah, and then so it stands for Pulse Instantiated A-Stable Nerdy Organ, piano. And we did not come up with it, I think, Arvind did? Arvind was on um, a ops co-lead two years ago, and he came up with this brilliant name, so applause to him. <laughs> yes, and then so this project will be very similar to project one, where we use the 555 timer and in the same orientation and same layout to control, um, to create an oscillating pattern across the speaker. But what we will do differently this time is we will be able to control the pitch and have multiple notes playing, or multiple notes you can control with the three buttons. And then so how we do that is the, with the use of a potentiometer and a couple of more resistors. All right, so this is how the schematic of Project 3 will look like. As you can see, because we're using a 555 timer, a lot of the pins are the same as the first two projects. For example, pin one goes to ground, right? <laughs> pin three goes to the output, in which case is our speaker, just like project one. Pin eight goes to VCC. Uh, the key difference now here is that you no longer need a threshold or a control voltage, right? You're not gonna be constantly charging and discharging anything. That's why pin five actually doesn't go to anything in this one. So keep that in mind when uh, you're soldering. Don't accidentally put a capacitor there or a resistor or a wire. You just, just leave that port blank, right? Next thing you want to keep in mind is that there's actually a potentiometer there. So it looks like the symbol for a resistor, except there's an arrow. And the arrow basically is on the potentiometer. You can, you can turn it, right, to, to, to change um, how much voltage uh, it, it's dividing, or in the case that we're going to be using it as a variable resistor, how much resistance it's outputting, right? And so that's what the arrow uh, represents. Uh, basically, it's a changeable or a variable resistor, right? So you have a potentiometer connected to a switch, which connects to another resistor, which connects to a switch, which connects to another resistor, which connects to a switch, right? And you, you want to keep in mind that each time you press, uh, not a switch, a push button, my bad, but each time you press a push button, uh, you'll be outputting a different frequency of sound, and that's what will be outputted to the speaker. So Basically, you can create three different uh, types of sound, and then using the potentiometer, uh, technically speaking, how many ever turns a potentiometer has, three to the power of that, different frequencies. So you can, you can play some pretty cool songs if you're uh, good with it, like how some people played a song with Project One. You can, you can do that with this project, too. Next slide. All right, so what is a potentiometer? So if you guys haven't seen it, um, it was in, it should be in your ops kit box. Um, it was this little thing with like three leads and you can like kind of turn the knob on um, left and right. So that's the potentiometer and that's the most common one with three leads. And it is commonly used to control like significant amount of power. But in, for our case, we're j j only gonna use two of the pins and use it as a um, variable resistor. So. Let me, guys ask you, let me ask you guys this. So if you have a resistor that is about this big, right? And then we keep the density and dimensions the same except for the length, where I extend the length of the resistor. Then would the resistance of this object get bigger, smaller, or stay the same? Bigger. bigger. And that's pretty logical, right? Because you have more um, of the resistant object. So the, um, when current goes through it, it will be limited further. So this is the concept or the logic that we use to implement a potentiometer, where if you, use, if you consider the pin um, A and W, which is the left and middle one, so if current flows through into A and it flows out to W, right? And then, but 
the resistance between A and W will differ depending on where the knob is turned. Because let's say in this position, you have, you're using around like one third of the total resistant um, object. Whereas if you turn the knob clockwise, then you're getting more of the resistance, right? Which means that um, the more you turn it right, um, the less your current, um, your current will decrease basically. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. And then so for us, it doesn't really matter f um, which one we use as long as we use the middle one for, um, as one of the pins. So, but for us, we, let's just use, for us, we're just going to specify that the middle pin, so W, goes towards the switch. And the pin on the right, um, looking at this orientation, goes to pin 7, which um, makes sense to according to our schematic. So it, everything will make sense if you refer this to, back to the schematic. And then same for project 3. We're going to breadboard first. And you guys will have to get that checked off by us. And then, but there isn't going to be an online portion for this one. So once you guys have um, gotten your breadboarding checked off, you can start soldering right away. Oh. Yeah. Um, another thing, quick thing to add for, uh, to that. So uh, the potentiometer, so what happens if you use all three leads, right? Um, you know, right now we're only using two. Potentiometer basically acts like a voltage divider. So you, on one lead, you have positive voltage. On the negative lead, you have, or on the other lead, other end, you'd have um, whatever difference, like ground or something like that, right? And from the middle, middle uh, lead, you'd get anywhere between zero or whatever your least amount of voltage to the other end. So let's say, for example, I put five volts on the one end and zero on the other. From turning the knob, I can go anywhere from zero to five volts um, outputted from the potentiometer. So that's, that's the pur purpose of a potentiometer if you use all three leads. And just using two is a variable resistor. Yeah, and then so if you guys were wondering why changing the resistance makes a difference to the output on the speaker, um, can someone remind me how the 555 timer worked in terms of our implementation? Like, what did it use to make the oscillating or the blinking pattern for the LED or the speakers? Yes. The photoresist kind of, but what was the main role that allowed the um, oscillating effect, the blinking effect. Yes. Exactly. So it uses the charging and discharging of the capacitor to, um, and it uses that as a basis for the oscillation, right? And then if you realize, um, the thing that's charging the uh, capacitor is current, right? So the more current you have, the faster your capacitor will charge. So by changing the resistance, we can control the amount of current that flows through the system. So if you have higher resistance, then it's less current, which means it takes a long, it takes a longer time for the capacitor to charge up, which will result in a slower um, oscillation. So by using the potentiometer and using the series, or the uh, resistors in series, we, we are able to um, change the pitch of the sound that comes out of the speaker. Any questions yeah. before we move on? Uh, since we're not connecting anything to the five thing, the, mm -hmm. the five, 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 uh, mm -hmm. how's it good? So the five thing was used to discharge, right? The five thing mm -hmm. was used as a control, oh, yeah. right? But here we have no control for it to charge, oh. discharge, yeah. So you said when we turn the knob, mm -hmm. change the voltage, we get across the, um, the potentiometer, if you use all three leads. Right, the middle lead outputs the the voltage that you want. So from zero to whatever, you, or the difference between whatever two that you are outputting or inputting on the two ends. But since we're using using it as a variable resistor, you just use the middle and any other pin, and it changes the amount of resistance based on how much you've turned the dial. Because there's a resistive material inside of it, and it only has to travel to that and then back out. So you can change uh, how much current or how much resistance there is. So for example, if I press buttons one and two, right? Can you go actually back one slide? Uh, other way. There we go. So let's say I press buttons S1 and uh, or let's say I just press S1, right? Um, and I'll, I'll press S2, S1 and S2, right? So now I have 2.7k resistor in series with a potentiometer. 
um, I don't know, let's put an arbitrary number for the potentiometer, 5, 5k, right? So because it's in series, right, if I just press S1, I have the values from 0 to 10k for the potentiometer. But now by pressing S1 and S2, I have between 2.7 and 12.7k. So each, each further resistor and how many other buttons you press down corresponds to more um, possibilities of, of different uh, resistances so you can change the pitch of your speaker. Yeah. If you wanted to be like fun, you could put whatever other resistors you want on there. We're going to give, give you uh, two 2.7k resistors, but it's up to you. So um, it, it's not the capacitor that knows how to discharge. So the 555 timer, um, how it works is, to put it simply, it detects the um, voltage across C1 in that schematic above, which is in below. So it detects the voltage across that. And then when the, so the voltage across the capacitor starts from zero, right? And it starts building up as current um, goes into it. And then, so as it goes up, it detects a specific threshold. And if it goes above that threshold, then the 555 timer will um, enable the discharge pin, which is pin 7. And then, so it will discharge the capacitor. And then, if it goes below a th specific threshold, which is um, given by the trigger pin, pin 2, then it will disenable the tr um, discharge pin and start going back up. So it, it creates that oscillating pattern. Yeah. yeah. And if you have more questions, we can answer it afterwards. Yeah. Also, just to keep in mind, the capacitor is 100 nanofarads. That's the same one as uh, the yellow ceramic capacitor you used in Project 1 and in Project 2. You guys should have one more left, right? Because you only soldered one in Project 2, so you can use that one for this project. So Any point 0.1 question? micro equals 100 nano. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing, yeah. Any more questions? All right, let's go next. And go next one more time, yeah. So, some reminders and tips for this project, right? Uh, as you guys may have seen from project one, the speakers are a bit flimsy, right? So, uh, we recommend two things, right? Now that you know how to solder, if for any reason your uh, leads fall off of your, your speakers, just get stronger wires. You can cut wires from the lab and solder them back onto the speaker, right? That, that's tip number one, if in case your speaker leads fall off. The second tip, and the one that we encourage, is that you use female headers. So like how you use a, the 8-pin dip socket to put in uh, your fi on, the, on the soldering board instead of using your 555 timer directly, you can also put female headers and solder that on to uh, the, the soldering, the perf board, so that you don't have to solder your speakers into it, right? Because you might use your speakers in a project for uh, in the next quarter or the quarter after. And how the female headers look, uh, it's, it's shown over there, right? We have them in the lab in the ops box where you've been collecting parts so far. And you essentially just cut off one, uh, one or, or, or just one hole, I guess. And that's all you need to put in for each of the speaker leads, right? And so wherever your speaker would go, instead of putting the speakers, now you put one female header in each one, and then you plug the speakers into that. Second tip uh, is your battery. So, when you're soldering your batteries, once again, don't keep your batteries near the soldering iron. If it blows up, it'll actually blow up because it's 500 milliamps. And you don't want to solder your, ba your battery directly onto your perf board. You want to solder the JSD connector. So you can actually take that off of your battery, right? You, you're given two of them in project one. You can just solder that in directly and then plug in your battery and plug it out when you're done using it. Next tip. Once again, you'll be using a 555 timer, so remember to collect one more 8-pin dip socket from the ops bin, right? You, you know where that is, right above the ops drawer. You can just get one more from there. And then, yeah, female headers for the speakers. And once again, remember to clean up after yourself, right? We reiterated this on Facebook once and the beginning of this lecture, and once again right now, right? We want to keep the lab <laughs> safe for everyone to use and not a mess. And for people who have problems with the desoldering pump getting stuck, if you actually push it in really hard, they seem to get unstuck. So just try that. If you feel like it's stuck, ask someone else to push, keep pushing it in until <laughs> it gets unstuck. Oh, yeah. and also, oh. another thing. So um, this project, um, it involves a lot mo more components than the previous ones, which means that you guys will have to 
use um, your breadboard very efficiently. Even we had a hard time like trying to lay the entire schematic out onto the breadboard. So just be very careful with um, how you breadboard it and how you solder it on, because it will be a lot more dense than um, project one and project two. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, so that's like the recommend, like you should have around like three pins that are cut off. So you could easily do two or cut two pins off. Because if you try to, so what happens is our female headers that are in our ops box, um, they come in like strips of like. Eight oh, to 16. Eight to six, it's like very, very long, it's long, but you won't yeah. need that much, right? So, but if you try to just um, cut one pin off, then you'll probably like, break only half of it off or something. Yeah. So just to make, so um, just to be careful, like, or just to be safe, just try to cut two pins or three pins off at a time so that you know for sure you have at least one pin that's um, That's working, in, yeah. yeah. And then when you solder, you only need to solder that one working pin. You don't need to worry about the other two or other one. All right, and then actually brought up a good point. So not only do you have to be careful with planning on your breadboard, but you got to be a little ca more careful planning on your soldering, uh, your perf board, right? So I saw a lot of people planning it out like on a piece of paper or like their iPad, their laptop, whatever. That is a good idea, but that's also a very time consuming idea. What I would recommend instead is to just push in your parts into the, into the perf board, but don't solder them in, and then plan it out directly on the perf board itself. Like take a Sharpie, a pen, something else, and just draw the traces out. That way you don't have to like keep looking back at your paper before drawing it, because mm -hmm. That's double the chance of making a mistake. You could have made a mistake on the paper, and then once again, we're copying it over to your perf board, right? And then this way, you, you have it all in front of you when you're, when you're soldering, right? It's on the perf board. You're looking at it constantly. And when you're doing that, make a mental check to yourself after you solder in a part or two. See if that's how it's supposed to look, right? A few people I saw today, they soldered it in. They were all done. They came up to me, and then they realized that they had mirrored it wrong. And so they had to desolder everything and resolder it over again, right? So just just don't do it all at once. Do I mean do it all at once if you want to, but don't just <laughs> do it all at once without looking and making a sanity check. Like, is it supposed to be? Does it look like how the breadboard or the schematic looks like? Take a picture of your breadboard before you start soldering, so you know roughly how it's supposed to look like. You know, just any other thing, and make good use of like common uh, pin. Like for example, you know that pin one. It's going to go to ground. You know that the end of the capacitor is also going to go to ground, grow to ground. And you can stretch the capacitor out a little bit, right? So instead of putting it really close to each other like this and then having a big long trail to go to ground, maybe you could stretch it out and put it directly near ground and then have a really small trail that goes to ground, right? Things like that will help you better optimize space on the perf board. Um, but yeah, that's just another just tips and tricks to keep in mind. Next slide. All right, so can someone tell me what is wrong <laughs> with these two workstations? So raise, just raise your hands. <laughs> yep, Any, anything in specific? It's a little hard to see. I, I believe so, yes. The soldering iron is turned on. Yeah, there's scraps yeah. on the table. Anyone else? He's answering everything. Oh, yeah. No, it's fine if they're plugged in. You just want to turn it off with the switch. Um, yeah. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I sure that is a hazard because, yes, you're soldering. And if you drink that water, you might get cancer. But that, that is a hazard in its own. But they have their tools out, right? They use different tools, like pliers and whatnot, to cut off their wires, cut off their parts after they finish soldering it, and they never took it back. And while this is not so much of a safety hazard, it's a hazard, or it's more of an inconvenience to other people who are looking for those parts, right? Let's say I just came into the lab to do something, and all of the wire cutters are gone, but you're hoarding them all near your workstations, and you forgot to put it back once you were done, right? And the people after you are also too lazy to put it back, so it just stays there for the whole time, and then no one can find it, right? So after you're done using your parts, put them back. Uh, when you guys are desoldering, the desoldering pumps make a lot of mess. Remember to clean that up and throw it in the trash. Turn off your iron so that nothing blows up. 
don't put your batteries near the iron so nothing blows up. And then uh, just in general, remember to like keep it back. And when you use the fans, right, actually put the fans near where you're soldering. If you just have them on in the back, they're not going to do anything. Um, they're pretty short range, right? So to put them like maybe 10 inches or a foot away from where you're soldering, and then that should suck up all the air so you're not breathing it in. Next slide. All right. Cool. So a couple of reminders. Once again, soldering, plan your solder trails very carefully, right? Um, you don't, I know that if you, a lot of you guys probably have realized that desoldering is a pain in the ass, so plan it very carefully. P have patience. Not everyone is good at it from the start. Some of you guys are, which I was pretty impressed by, but I was very crappy at soldering too, but it just takes time and practice, so bear with it. Yes. And then, so for the online portion that you guys have um, for project two, please check back on Slack to see that you guys have been checked off. Yes. Yeah. And then if you guys have any questions related to projects, ask on Piazza. Recently, we've seen a couple of pretty good questions. So um, if you guys have questions that um, concern anything, just refer to Piazza. And then if that wasn't asked already, then ask away. And then, so if you guys were in the lab either yesterday or today, you guys will probably have realized that it is very crowded. It was very lit. And then, so like today, literally like an hour ago, I saw like two girls, are you guys here? Like you, they were like sitting outside to work on their breadboarding. So you guys will, yeah, so it gets really crowded. So try not to procrastinate on your projects. Do them early. Come in when there's, you know, fewer people in the lab so that you guys will have more attention by the officers and more space to work with. Yeah, like, yeah. for example, you guys, are, you guys are pretty lucky that this week there's nothing for advanced projects or micromouse for soldering, right? So those stations were pretty much open just for you. But for this project, you know, if you don't come in early enough, they might just be full. You'll just be waiting there for hours and hours. And those projects take a long time to solder, more than like an hour or two hours that it takes for, for the ops project. So, you know, make sure to come on weekends if you can, or just as early as you can. If you have an hour, breadboard in the hour. Next hour, you're free. Finish half your soldering. Next hour, you're free. Just finish the rest of it off. Um, but yeah, make sure you guys plan. Um, is there like a time where it normally is in the morning? Like if I come at 10 a.m., will it be open? So if yes. you look at the lab hours, those, lab, those hours for sure, it's guaranteed to be open. So it's 10 a.m., yes. 10 a.m. is a guarantee that yeah. it'll be open up to 6 p.m. every day. Okay. That, that is a guarantee. Now, some officers can choose to stay after if they have their own project that they're working on or you want to hold a work session or something. For that, look, look on the Slack or, or ask in the Facebook group. Um, but yeah, 10 to 6 guaranteed every day on weekdays. On weekends, there's like a 90 to 99% chance that the lab will be open. Just ask and someone should respond to you. Um, but yeah. So you have, you have a lot of different times that you can, you can choose to come in, and you can spread out your work so you're not doing one giant chunk of six or eight hours of work. Um, next slide. Right, so some last reminders, right? Um, or some policy reminders, right? So we haven't really seen this, much, this to be too, too much of a problem, but it start, if it does start to become a problem, the first time you leave a workstation messy, you're going to get a warning. And every time after that, there'll be $15 off of your deposit. And we'll let you know that you've been marked off for that so you know who, who you are, right? And, and just, just remember, clean up. It's not that hard to do. It takes 30 seconds to a minute max um, after you, you finish soldering or breadboarding or cutting your wires or whatever it is that you're doing in the lab, right? Now, second thing, if you don't complete your projects by the end of the quarter, you will lose $25 off of your deposit, uh, just period. Like, it, it doesn't matter what you do. You can finish it later. You just lose $25. But that still means, that, let's say you don't finish all of fall quarters, you can still finish all of winter and all of spring and get back $75, right? Once again, we don't want to hold your money. On the second note, though, if you do complete them all, we're looking to see if we can give you back $20 at the end of the quarter. So it's like an incentive. If you finish it, you still get part of it back. But if you don't finish it, then you don't get a bigger chunk of it back.
but we'll let you guys know and keep you guys updated if uh, we end up doing that, that option. Um, yeah, any questions? Okay, so basically, if you, if you don't finish your projects, you will lose $25 off of your deposit by the end of the quarter. Yeah, so all the projects were like, so we're looking into this, right? It hasn't really been done before, but if you finish all of your projects for that quarter, you get $20 back off of your $100. So you get 20, 40, and then the 60 at the end of the year. So you end up getting all of your money back. It's just staggered, right? So you have a reason to finish it. You still get part of it back, right? At the end of the quarter, yeah. So like, you finish all of it this quarter, like first week of next quarter, we'll give you back $20. Like Venmo, check, cash. However, we decided to, if we decide to go through with that. We're still talking with uh, the project manager and the treasurer if that's possible, if that's feasible uh, logistically. Or we might just give you back the 100 at the end of the year, like how it's usually been done in the past. Okay. Yeah. Question? Yo, uh, will that be open during the finals week? Uh, wait, wait, during finals week? No. Oh, oh like week of finals? Yeah. No. Why? Oh, do them before. <laughs> yeah, do them before, <laughs> right? Like, especially, like, I know most years are freshmen, third year transfers, right? Week seven, week eight, midterms, week nine, that's like your chill week after all your midterms, just finish it off then. Or we'll finish it off, I guess next week is seventh week. Never mind, don't worry <laughs> about that. Yeah, ninth week, tenth week, early tenth week, that's when you guys might be f more free. Finish it off then, just get it done with. Don't worry about it until after final. I can guarantee that once finals are done, you don't want to stay at school any longer. You want to go back home, go relax. Especially with a four week winter break, I definitely don't want to stay here after finals. I want to go back home and relax. So finish it off early. Next slide. All right. So we're gonna, we've decided to extend the project two due date, right? Uh, some of you still haven't finished yet, so now it will be due at 4 p.m. next Tuesday. But remember, if you guys wait until 4 p.m. next Tuesday, I guarantee you that the soldering station will be full and you'll be even more late, right? So this is just like in case you didn't finish it. Second thing, we have an ultimate Frisbee social next Friday, right? It'll be on the IM field? Yes. IM field, right? So that's the field across Poly. Um, come out to it. Come meet new IEEE members, people in other projects, things like that. And we'll enjoy some fun Ultimate Frisbee. And then Project 3 due date is to be decided still. Um, it'll most likely be due uh, the Monday of week 10 or right before Thanksgiving break. So we're still deciding on that, which one we feel that more people will be able to finish within that time frame. Uh, but just expect it to be around that time. So we don't want you to working on it after uh, Monday of week 10. We want you to, to focus on your finals, focus on your studies, things like that. I believe it's the week 29th of November. I mean, you can, you can check, just look forward three weeks from now or four weeks from now, and that's Monday of week 10, right? Um, but yeah, don't work on ops, work on your finals that late in the, in the period, or in, in the quarter. And then finally. Yes. So. We have a Snapchat, IEEE Ops. So this was designed um, with the intent that, so we noticed that some of you guys don't really completely read your emails or Facebook posts, right? And I feel like all you guys read are like Snapchat stories or like memes. So we designed this as, an, um, as a reminder for you guys for any updates or just any cool things that are going in Ops. So like maybe like embarrassing solder shows that you guys, your friend did or something. So. This is not mandatory, but if you want, please do follow IEEE Ops. Take a photo or something. <laughs> yep. What? what? Oh, we'll be posting like reminders, like good things, bad things, funny things in the lab, <laughs> someone sleeping, things like that. Um, <laughs> Wait, what? Will we read your snaps? Yeah. Maybe. Probably. I mean, <laughs> we might screenshot it too. Yeah, we might <laughs> screenshot it. So, so just, just yeah. What? Do we do streaks? No, no, we're not doing streaks. <laughs> I don't know, dude. It, it, it's too early, but, but yeah. 
Oh, yeah, it'll, it'll be fun. Yeah. It'll be something, something yeah. interesting. And then lastly, so for the ultimate frisbee social, so the events coordinator uh, made a special request to tell you guys that um, there is a Google form of interest. So um, there's an event on Facebook that you guys can find. Um, I will share it with you guys in the face the off Facebook group like um, pretty soon. But yeah, there's if you are interested, then just um, fill that out. And then let's try to get an ops team going for Ultimate Frisbee. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, and then, I'd be down. All right. Any final questions before we finish lecture three? All right. I think next slide. I, I think right. that's it. Yeah, you guys are good Thanks. to go.